Thank you, Anil. And uh, welcome to all of you. Um, again, those of you in the room and those of you on the web, uh, we appreciate your taking the time to spend with us. Uh, we're going to have a very interesting um, set of uh, presentations and perspectives to share with you uh, over the next day or two. And uh, what I wanted to do was try to put into context um, what we're all about, what we're trying to get done, not just in the R&D, um, but out in the marketplace, and what are some of the long-term trends that we see, and how are we going to go participate in them and, and ultimately deliver the benefit uh, to our customers as well as our shareholders. So the first thing I want to do is just get the financial plan um, uh, uh, reviewed, give you a sense of how we did in Q2. Um, we've obviously uh, we pre-announced those and then we announced those, so I figured I could post-announce those as well. Um, secondly, go through, you know, where do we see the growth? And there's a lot of um, interesting speculation about the impact of virtualization and the impact of the American economy and the impact of a variety of technology trends. Really give you a sense of where we see the growth, what are some of the uh, the, the buying patterns as well as perspectives that we hear from the marketplace and how we're putting our technologies behind them. And then lastly, end on how are we going to grow? You know, what are the ways that we're going to take our resources, take our talent, take our skills uh, and our presence across the marketplace and make sure we can deliver um, not just bottom line growth and not just growth and adoption of our technologies, but growth in our overall business value um, and long-term value to our shareholders. So uh, at a top level, <clears throat> Again, this is what we announced um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, Q2 was a very good quarter for us. Uh, we saw a lot of very uh, encouraging signs in the underlying uh, bookings growth, deferred revenue growth. Um, we had a lot of demand uh, across the world. Um, a smaller portion of that uh, uh, obviously transitioned to revenue, which is a reflection of a couple things. Um, and notably within the US, a change in how we do business one of, with uh, some of our resellers and channel partners. But across the board, the leading indicators and the financial leading indicators of that growth were certainly there. Um, and again, you saw that uh, on the bookings line and also with the double-digit expansion of our deferred revenue. Um, gross margins were quite healthy. Um, and this is, <clears throat> for Sun, not just a cost exercise. This isn't about buying cheaper components. Um, that's certainly an element in there, but that element's been in there uh, for the past decade. Um, this is as much about our investing in the kinds of innovations that customers want. And the way that we measure that is whether they're willing to pay for them. So when we deliver integrated systems, when we deliver innovation, a gross margin in some sense is a reflection of the value that our customers see and are willing to share with us. Um, we've been uh, closely managing our OPEX, um, bringing that down slightly year over year. But the net result is we had a pretty significant boost in operating income and an expansion of our operating margin. And as we've said before, uh, we believe we're on target to deliver 8% operating margin in Q4, um, as well as going forward um, on an organic basis to deliver 10% um, you know, a year from now. So overall, we were very happy with the performance we had in Q2. We saw good execution um, in the, uh, from the product perspective, great feedback from customers. Um, we held a, an event with about 150 global channel partners. Um, who all shared with us the same uh, insights that they saw demand out there and they saw Sun's relevance um, to that demand growing. And so, uh, you know, again, a good foundation, uh, a lot more work to go do, but uh, we're certainly executing against the plan that we put out. So <clears throat> as we look to the marketplace, though, I think we're beginning to see the markets teasing apart in some pretty interesting ways. I think the, the most important um, delineation for us is that not all demand is equal. And my favorite example of this is when you, you know, when I walk into my, you know, dentist, which I did uh, this past week, I walked up to the receptionist, you know, I could see behind her desk there was a server um, that was running the little local uh, patient management applications. We did not provide that server. I was not all bust up about that. And one reason is that's just not a target uh, for Sun. We're not in the tower server marketplace. Um, I think we believe that tower servers and kind of localized infrastructure like that is going to move. Um, into devices and up into the network. Um, and so, again, not all demand is equal. For the customers for us are those that see IT as a competitive weapon. And that is not a category into which my dentist falls. And for a broad majority of those that purchase technology in the marketplace, IT is not a weapon, it's a cost. And the good news for them is those costs are going to come down and down as Moore's Law and its you know, parallels in the storage and bandwidth world continue to deliver innovation at a rate that exceeds the demand. But for three core markets, and the three markets that we're um, most focused on, 
um, we believe that the customers that we're serving that see IT as a competitive weapon will continue to look to Sun as being central to their plans to use technology to grow their value. <clears throat> and these three markets for us right now fall into the following. The broad bucket of enterprise infrastructure is just the traditional systems used to run folks' businesses, their payroll systems, their CRM systems, their internal applications, um, to a certain extent, their, their external applications, but just the, the traditional automation of existing business processes. The high-performance computing marketplace is whether you're in the business of modeling proteins or forecasting the weather or analyzing portfolios or looking for oil, uh, high-performance uh, computing is really the aggregation of very, very large amounts of computational storage uh, and bandwidth in pursuit of the solution of business problems. And then finally, the web build-out, which is, as the world moves online, how are we all going to talk to one another? How are businesses going to talk to consumers? How are consumers going to talk to one another? And that build-out is distinct from the world of high-performance computing and certainly distinct um, from the world of enterprise infrastructure. But it's all related in the sense that the bottom two markets are growing in such a way that they will begin to become enterprise infrastructure. And so as we look at this, we're looking at it not as markets in isolation. We're looking at this really in terms of the overall community of developers, the community of consumers, and how they begin to merge together. And so our focus at Sun is taking our technologies, using those technologies to build communities, and working with those communities to identify better ways of solving the problems faced by some of our core demographics. Now, what you won't see on this slide is the banking industry, or telecommunications, or social networking, or governments. Those are all industries that use the following types of infrastructure, but in some sense, they're verticalizations of the market that don't really apply anymore. For the majority of our telecommunications companies, they view themselves as being in the media industry, and they view themselves as being platforms for social networking. If you talk to the social networking companies, you'll see for a great majority of them, they're beginning to look at high-performance computing for, to understand the trends and the, and the opportunities that exist within their marketplace. If you look at the enterprise infrastructure companies, if you look at traditional enterprises, they're all looking to the web to go reach consumers and reach the broadest marketplace possible. So for Sun, what we're attempting to do is, as we've done uh, historically, not simply sell to these markets, but to enable the markets to invent and to create technologies that attract the types of developers and attract the kinds of communities that allow companies to take technology and generate value from it. So what I'd like to do is walk you through a few examples of these, in part to, to give you a, a sense of who our customers are here and to see the value that they're deriving from Sun, but also to talk to you about some of the linkages that we're beginning to see between and among uh, these, uh, what appear to be disparate markets, but are obviously quite linked together. So our core enterprise infrastructure market <clears throat> is, again, serving uh, the world's demand uh, for the automation of business processes. And these are folks who see value not simply in the technology we deliver, but in the global service we deliver. Our, our, our uh, ability to give peace of mind to the largest companies in the world that want to put applications into deployment and then have those deployments serviced across the world. And these are just a few of the companies that we've talked about in the last year or so who are using our technology to automate their business processes, to run more efficiently, to create new value. But what's interesting in terms of the trends that we see here, and certainly they're continuing to kind of groom their legacy and find out ways to minimize their spending on legacy and maximize their investments into the future, but one of the ways they're doing that is not simply by optimizing their own infrastructure, they're beginning obviously to turn to some of the service providers. Whether companies like eBay, um, who's gonna be a direct retailer of the goods and services delivered, not simply a provider of online auctions. Companies like Sugar CRM, which is um, you know, one of the most exciting CRM companies out there, especially in the open source community. Companies like Salesforce.com, which are obviously not optimizing people's CRM infrastructure, they're replacing that CRM infrastructure, the evolution of software as a service is certainly giving opportunities to the largest companies in the world for them to look at their spending and say, how do I just stop? Instead of how do I take my legacy and try to turn it into a cloud, why don't I just use somebody else's service infrastructure? And it's a trend we see, and we don't think it's going to stop across the world. And obviously, the companies on the left, um, when they do that, are also purchasing infrastructure. The companies on the right are building out very large-scale infrastructure. But all of this, to us, is the enterprise infrastructure marketplace. 
It's not just traditional legacy computing and now let's go look at the future. You know, obviously these businesses on the left are playing a very strong role and an interesting one in the definition of the future, as much as the companies on the right. So the second marketplace in high performance technical computing, we just went live, I got a note this morning um, at TAC, the Texas Advanced Computing Center. This is about a half a petaflop grid, roughly 63,000 cores, 130 terabytes of RAM, multiple petabytes of storage. It's a very large computer. Um, and I think the way it was expressed to me, it is larger than all other NSF-granted computing systems combined. So it's really big. Um, it takes a lot of power to go run that. And why is it being built? It's being built for uh, any number of different applications. It's going to be delivered as a service to other uh, NSF grantees who are going to take the, the availability of that resource to go forecast the weather, to go model proteins, to go do academic research. And whether it's the Tokyo Institute of Technology, TITEC, or KISTI, the Korea Institute of Science and Technology Information, these are academic high-performance computing grids, which are really pushing the envelope in terms of scale, throughput, performance, and ultimately value. Now, when you think about traditional high-performance computing, you tend to think about these big grids that are being built. If you tend to look at the top 500 supercomputers, you tend to see a lot of academic installations. But what you tend not to see are the businesses that are using high-performance computing and using those technologies, whether it's the Sun Grid Engine, as TAC is using, or our InfiniBand infrastructure, which also TAC is using, or just you know, uh, large-scale pools of computation uh, and storage resources, whether you're hunting for oil or hunting for buying patterns, or hunting for more optimal routes to, to get your trucks through city streets or airplanes through the world, high-performance computing is not simply an academic exercise. It is the fastest growing segment of the computation marketplace. Um, it's going to continue to give uh, benefit not only to those academics that are using these technologies to go discover the, the you know, next generation uh, Nobel Prizes, um, it's also going to be used by the enterprises that want to leverage those insights to go make better business decisions. So again, there's a lot of advanced computing going on on the left, and a lot of that is now being absorbed in traditional enterprises. And obviously, our investments on the left with the acquisitions uh, uh, such as the cluster file system, Luster, um, as well as the Sun Grid Engine, and a whole variety of investments we're making are designed not simply to get us popular with the, uh, the groups on the left, but to ensure that our relevance and our role with those businesses on the right is as strong as it's ever been. Now, lastly, the web build-out. Um, and there are, you know, uh, obviously the brands here are as important as the technologies themselves. Some of these companies um, are aggregating millions and tens of millions of users and subscribers on a global basis. And they're beginning to create immense amounts of value. Obviously, um, one of them in particular was um, the subject of a hostile takeover this week. And, um, but we're not limiting our view of the, the marketplace for web infrastructure to be the world's social networking companies. Um, because if you talk to the businesses that we talk to, again, on a global basis, they're looking at web infrastructure as a means of talking to consumers. And not to build an ad network, but to build a banking network. Or to build a travel network. Or to build a telecommunications network. And so the infrastructure that's going into this, again, is eclipsing in scale and in growth the infrastructure that's gone into traditional infrastructure. But again, these are not systems that are built in isolation. These are systems that are syndicated together. So when you recognize a customer, you can serve that customer, you can attach them to their infrastructure, and you can harvest the data from them to figure out how to better serve them going forward. So these markets in aggregation are how we look at our product development. They are not, again, divided up by industry segment. Um, they're not divided up geographically. You know, companies are using high-performance computing and web infrastructure the world over. Um, but they are how we think about, well, are we doing a good job of serving the market? We talk to those customers. They give us a lot of feedback, not just on our product roadmaps, but how e easy is it to buy from us? How easy is it for us to get your software? And these are exactly the kinds of things that we're responding to uh, on a daily basis. So in terms of what we hear from these customers, it's actually fairly consistent consistent across all three segments in the marketplace. Most folks that we talk to care about scale. And the scale that we're talking about is what happens when my registered user base goes from 10,000 to 100,000 to 10 million to 100 million, not what happens in my dentist's office. 
And so these scale both economics. If you think of a, a, of a site like TAC, um, TAC, again, at roughly uh, half a petaflop, has to be concerned not only with what's the power consumption for that, but what's the physical weight of the cables that are going in, what's the complexity of running the infrastructure. Scale economics are becoming, the, in some ways, the defining uh, element that, uh, that our customers care about. What is the long-term cost of building, constructing, operating, and ultimately harvesting value from the infrastructure that you go deploy? When we talk about eco, um, as our uh, VP of Eco Responsibility likes to point out, eco does not simply mean ecology. Eco also means economics. When power is your number two uh, uh, discretionary operating expense in a data center, you're going to get pretty focused on your, on your eco footprint. Because it's costing you real money, the better you manage it, the more efficiently you can deliver value. Second thing that we hear universally from all customers, uh, virtualization and automation. These are not products and technologies you try to slap onto your legacy. These are ways that you architect for your future. From the companies that we talk to, this is just an assumption of how they run. If you talk to a company like a LinkedIn or a Facebook, you cannot, after the fact, figure out how to virtualize it. You have to build in from the outset the idea that you are going to have very, very highly efficient uh, utilization within your data center. 15% server utilization when you have 5,000 systems or 10,000 systems is just not OK. And so for these companies, it's a part of how they think about their architecture. It's for the most part not how they think about um, remediating their past. It's a part of what they're architecting in going forward. Thirdly. You know, if there's one thing I hear consistently um, from every customer, from every corner of the earth that I talk to, it's we're trying to consolidate onto a smaller number of platforms. And we believe we're going to have one proprietary platform and we're going to have one open source platform. And that way we have vendor diversity, we've got competition, we've got two pools of innovation, but we've also got the ability to kind of, in some sense, tame uh, a lot of the innovation that was done that created complexity. So there's lots and lots of different open source projects out there, lots and lots of different open source operating systems, different uh, open source approaches. Customers want to start to, to align that back into a form that allows them to say, when I go to my developers, I can give them two options. You can pick from the two following platforms. You can select whichever is going to deliver better value for you. And as you march on going forward, what we see from across the, the world and from across our customer base is they're trying to consolidate down to a smaller number of platforms, maximizing choice, maximizing innovation, and ultimately maximizing for interoperability. These are, again, not platforms that, that can work in isolation. In fact, there was a wonderful report this morning, um, which I highlighted on my blog from Forrester, which talked about the, the uh, in some sense, the recovery of Solaris uh, in financial services customers, but also, as interestingly, the interaction between .NET and the Java platform and the fact that they will coexist, that customers want them to coexist, that they want to uh, obviously have uh, more than one choice um, when they're building applications and going after customers. And to that end, the last thing I think that we hear consistently um, from customers is they're very focused on going and delivering value for their consumers. You know, when we talk not simply to financial services customers, but we talk to retailers, manufacturing companies, transportation companies, packaged goods uh, companies, logistics companies, they're very, very focused on using technology as a means of reaching their consumers, a means of reaching customers, of interacting with them, having that uh, self-service be instantaneous with the recognition that if you can't deliver to a customer quickly, they're simply going to point their browser to another site. Secondarily, that the consumers are part of the communities that they're trying to cultivate, that these are not simply you come do business with me and then you're gone, but instead to the extent that businesses can build those relationships over time, they can create higher value relationships with those customers which evolve into communities. Those communities end up having a very, very long-term and beneficial impact to the business um, that our customers are trying to go build. Obviously, that's how we view our investment in our core customers, our developer base. This is not simply, you know, they're going to buy something. Instead, we're focused on having them join communities, and to the extent that they're a member of those communities and are fueling those communities, they're giving us the insights we need to make better decisions about how we serve them going forward and ultimately serve the customers um, that are using their products um, as much as employing those developers. So again, these are four points um, that are really core to all the markets that we're serving. There's not one that's more important to any uh, of the markets than the other. 
Um, but the most important thing that I think our customers care about is innovation. And I think there are two groups of customers in the world, those that don't see value in innovation, those who see IT as a cost, and again, the good news for them is they can take that cost pretty much down to nothing, and those that see IT as a weapon, who are going to use technology as a means of progressing their business, beating their competition, you know, going after a broader customer base. So what I'd like to do is walk you through now what our core innovation is and how we're orienting that innovation to go after the markets that I just outlined. During the course of today's presentations, we'll be making projections and other forward-looking statements regarding expected future financial results and business opportunities. Our actual future results may be very different from our current expectations. We encourage you to read the 10Ks and 10Qs that we file periodically with the SEC. These documents contain a discussion of the risks facing our business, including factors that could cause these forward-looking statements not to come true. We do not currently intend to update these forward-looking statements. In addition, during the course of the conference, we may describe certain non-GAAP financial measures, which should be considered in addition to and not in lieu of comparable gap financial measures. For the most directly comparable gap financial measures and related reconciliations, please refer to the slides posted on the Sun Analyst Summit 2008 page and the earnings call financial slides and operations analysis, all of which can be found on the investor relations section of our website at sun.com slash investors.